All right, so this week, um, surprise, we're in John chapter 2. We're going to continue studying through the Gospel of John. If you don't know me, my name is Scott McCormick. Um, and yes, by name, this is the Wednesday night men's class at Cartersville First Baptist Church, but we're just going through the Gospel of John, and that's for everybody. I, I love the Gospel of John. It's, it's high on Christology. It's all about Jesus and who he is, what he did, and why he came for us. So as we are studying today, I lied. I said we were in John chapter 2. We're in John chapter 3. We're going to be studying about an interaction that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. You've probably heard about that guy. Um, before we dive into that, I'll open us in prayer, and then we'll do some reading. Um, but we'll just read through and dive in. So y'all bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are honored today with the opportunity to study your word. There are many around the world that don't have access to the scriptures. They don't have access to the scriptures in their own language. And many of them are not able to meet in person or remotely safely uh, with other Christians so that they can study your word. Because it's, it's dangerous there to even do so. But you have, even in the midst of great tragedy in our country because of the current crisis going on, you've allowed for us to continue to meet and to dwell together in your word. And this is a precious thing to us. We know that you have put your power in the words of your Bible, that the power to save and the power to sanctify are there. And so that's where we're going to find your truth, because that's where it is. That's where you put it. There's no words that I can say that can add to that. There's nothing that I can do to make it more convincing or easier to understand. These are things that you do in your spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use this time as the means to communicate to us by your spirit truths about your gospel and about your son that we need to know personally. I pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds as we study, so that there would be ample soil there for the seed to take root, that as we would meditate on your word throughout the rest of this week, that we would think back on the things that you've taught us tonight. Lord, tonight there are people who may be here for the purpose of studying, but they've also got other things on their mind, and that's understandable concerning the stress of the current day. And so, Lord, I pray that you would let those cares sort of slip into the background as we focus on you, that we would trust that you would continue to care for those needs in addition to our spiritual growth tonight. When we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's dive in. My name's Mr. Scott. We're in John chapter 3, and we have now left the wedding at Cana. We have we are still in Jerusalem while Jesus is there for the Passover feast. And something happens in the evening, in the nighttime. Something happens. I tell you what, let's read through. We're going to be John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I don't know if we'll get through all 15 verses. We'll get through as far as we can. And if we do finish, that'll be great. Um, but I'm just going to call out names so that y'all can read, and then there's going to be more things for us to read as well. Dad, you're first on my list. Can you please read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 4? Billow, if you'll read verses 5 through 8. And then Ben, if you will read verses 9 through 15. I know those aren't even segments, but they... They're cohesive segments. All right, Dad, if you'll start us off. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one else can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. How can these things be? Asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe. How will you believe if I tell you about things of heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Very good. Very good. So Jesus in the section immediately preceding this is still in Jerusalem. I'm going to draw my map again. We've got the Sea of Galilee up here. We started at Bethany. Then we went up here to Cana in Galilee, to Capernaum near the sea. And we, then we came down to Jerusalem. And why are we in Jerusalem? Who remembers why we came to Jerusalem? So, For the Passover feast. And when Jesus arrives, you remember he finds something that's just awful going on inside the temple, that there is moral corruption that is expressing itself by the buying and selling of oxen and sheep and doves and the exchanging of money at exorbitant rates. And this is going on inside the temple, which is intended for worship. Jesus makes a whip of cords, drives them all out. It makes the Jews in charge of the temple very mad. While he's in Jerusalem, he continues to do signs. And then while he's still in Jerusalem, a man comes to see him at night. And what is this man's name? Nicodemus. It's Nicodemus. And what do we know about Nicodemus? <clears throat> he's a Pharisee. He's, he's the a, teacher. He's a Pharisee. He's what? He is the teacher. He is the teacher. <clears throat> my, my version says a ruler of the Jews. Ruler of the Jews. This is good. So what we have here is a man that is a member of the Pharisees, which are a sect in the Jewish um, Sanhedrin. So if you think about the ruling body of the Jewish uh, community at the time, that ruling body was called the Sanhedrin. And there were two main parties, sort of like how we've got two main parties. We've got Republicans and Democrats. There are some other parties, but there's two main parties. And those are the Pharisees. And who are the other ones? Sadducees. They're the Sadducees. My kids sing a song at preschool. And it's a, I, I don't want to be a Sadducee because that would be sad, you see. And like every time they get to that part, I just shake my head because <laughs> whatever. They're in preschool. Like that doesn't matter. So <laughs> there's two main parties here and they're very different in their nature. The Pharisees were a very religious sect in that they were, they focused a lot on the law. They focused a lot on pursuing personal holiness as a means to relate to God and a means of achieving personal righteousness as a result. The Sadducees believed some very different things. One of the things they believed was that there was no resurrection from the dead. Well, if there's no resurrection from the dead, there's no afterlife. That means that any rewards that God's going to give us for good behavior or punishments for bad behavior will all happen in this life, which to them ended up mean. Uh, leading to a very materialistic lifestyle that they were always looking for material gain. And so you could see where these two parties sort of compose opposite ends of a spectrum within the Jewish community. And Nicodemus belongs to the Pharisees. And I wanted us to have that in our mind when we see him. I'm going to draw him up here. One of the first stick figures I ever drew on a board in church was Nicodemus. And he was what I called a super religious guy. 
So here's his cape, all right, because he's, he's like a super religious Nicodemus, okay? So that's Nicodemus. He's also referred to as a teacher because one of his jobs in the Sanhedrin as a ruler of the Jews was to teach the Bible to people. His job was to teach the law, not just to obey the law, but also to teach it. And he was a ruler of the Jews, meaning that he was a member of the body of the Sanhedrin. Um, when, the, when the Romans occupied territories, they, they did have like regional governors that ruled over different parts of the land. But when it came to communities having their own religious bodies and they might have their own laws that were a part of that, they would leave a lot of that oversight to the religious bodies that were there. So they gave the Sanhedrin some level of oversight. They could punish people based on their laws. But for example, one of the things they couldn't do was the death penalty. That was something that had to be done by the Romans, which is why Jesus was crucified by Romans and not actually by the Jews. So that's Nicodemus in a nutshell. And he comes to Jesus by night. He doesn't come to him during the day. He comes to see him at night. Why do you think that that is? <clears throat> I'd say because the Pharisees already have a pretty not so nice opinion of Jesus. All right, so, so one thought might be that he's worried about what other people think. <clears throat> and he, he kind of wants to hide it. All right, what else? I think it's also possible that he's trying to get a private audience with Jesus, and that was almost impossible to do during the daylight hours. Very good. Crowds followed him everywhere because of the signs. Absolutely. So I, as I was studying for this, those were the two things that came out. One was that he was concerned about what others might think. If he comes to Jesus at night, maybe nobody will notice him. And the other is that um, as a result of the crowds that constantly follow Jesus, and he wants to have a pretty intimate conversation with him here about some deep stuff, he comes to Jesus at night as a result. Now, we know that the disciples were still there with Jesus. This is not a one-on-one. -on -one. They didn't meet in a back alley behind a building and have this conversation. John, the evangelist who wrote this gospel, is giving us a very word-for-word, -word, very explicit account of how the conversation went. So at the very least, John was there, and it's not unsurprising to think that the rest of the disciples were also there. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he starts by calling him rabbi. Now, it's, it's not uncommon in the circles that Nicodemus ran in for rabbi to not necessarily mean that you are a teacher. It could have just meant that you are a learned person, but uh, they, they had a saying that, you know, a rabbi does not a teacher make. So that just because you, 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 you have the knowledge doesn't mean that you're actually good at teaching. But he follows up this word rabbi to make sure that he's paying Jesus the respect and understands what he's been doing. He follows up that word in verse 2 with the word teacher. So that's how he's addressing Jesus. Now, we've seen others address Jesus with some other words. What, what did uh, Nathaniel call Jesus? He called him rabbi, but he followed that up with something else. Back in John chapter 1, verse 49, what does, what does Nathaniel, he calls him rabbi first, but then he calls him something else. The king of Israel. The king of Israel. He says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Well, there's a, there's a different level there. Nicodemus is not addressing him at that level at this point. He is not, he's not seeing who Christ really is at this point. So he comes to him and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's, he's, he's respecting him as a teacher, He's saying that you are from God, so you may have been sent by God. He's not saying that you are God, you're just sent by God. And he also says this, he uses this phrase, we know. Well, who is he referring to by we know? What, my wife would say, well, is, is there a mouse in your pocket? Because it's just, 
It's just Nicodemus that has come to talk to Jesus. So who's he referring to when he says we? The rest of the Pharisees. The rest of the Pharisees. He's sort of generalizing about the group that he belongs to. So he says, it's not really just me that's recognizing that you're different. There's more than just me. He's sort of hinting that there are others who didn't come with him to talk to Jesus. They still sort of stay back. Okay, but he's referring to the rest of the Pharisees that they, they know that you are a teacher come from God. And what's the reason that they give? How do we know this? Signs. <clears throat> For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Jesus has been doing miracles and signs, and they've been witnessing this. And at the very least, what they can say is, he can't really be doing this unless God is with him. I mean, we could say that we don't like what he's teaching. We could say a whole lot of things. But what we can't deny is that God is actually with him. I mean, if he's sent from God, I mean, maybe even if we don't like it, we still have to pay attention. We still need to listen to him. Maybe we should go ask him what's going on. And so that's kind of where Nicodemus is at this point. He wants to know more from Jesus, so he's come to him at night. Now, hey, Scott, I had a question. Yes, sir. I was doing some reading to lead up to this, and I ran across some commentary I'd never read before from Ironside. Mm -hmm. And so I went and grabbed my Weast Word Study book, and it said in, chat, in uh, verse 1 that when you read the Greek, it actually says, but, but there was a man. And it said you have, and if you are, I guess, a textual scholar, mm -hmm. they were saying that, that the text is trying to draw a contrast between Nicodemus and the people it mentions in verse 24 of chapter 2 when it says Jesus knew what was in them. So I like the way Ironside put it. He said, in that context, Nicodemus is what you have to be today. You have to be an honest seeker. Mm -hmm. You can't just be an intellectual looking for facts. Right. And I'd never seen that before, and I thought that was a really good point. It gives us some insight into Nicodemus's perspective and motives, where he, sometimes he gets a bad rap as being an intellectual that's scared and going at night, mm -hmm. looking for facts, when I think he may have been more of an honest seeker, truly looking for truth. Oh, yeah. And I, I, read, um, <laughs> I read one commentary that said, you know, there are, there are several theologians that will give you varying reasons for why Nicodemus was there. You know, some say he's very timid, and so he's coming at night so nobody knows. Some say he's being wise, so he comes at night so that he gets a private audience. Some say that he's actually coming to try and trip Jesus up with his words. Now, I don't see that as being um, supported by the text, because usually when that happens, whoever's writing the gospel actually says that. The Jews came to try and trap him with his words. They'll actually say it. So I don't think that's the case here. But you're right in that this follows directly on the tale of it saying that there were many who believed in his name because of the signs that he did, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them. One of the things that we talked about last week was that in that passage, the words believe, and I don't know why I wrote a P there, the words believe and entrust have the same root words in the Greek. So as to say, the, this word in trust is pointing back to that word believe to say that Jesus did not believe in their believing. There was a level at which their believing was not saving faith, and it wasn't believing to the point of actually trying to understand and to learn more and to grow closer to him. And so he sees that in them. He sees what's really going on. And I'm glad you brought that up because when we, as we continue, let's look at verse 3 at Jesus's response to Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus has just come to him and made a general statement about what um, they believe Jesus to be. We know that you are a teacher sent from God because of these signs. There's no question in that. It's a statement, and it's a general statement. It's not even a very specific thing. And let's look at Jesus's immediate response. In verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus has, has done one of two things. 
he has either seen inside Nicodemus for the real reason why Nicodemus came to talk to him, or Jesus has, by his own authority, done a 180 on him and changed the subject. You've come to talk, if you've come to talk to me about these signs, let's talk about what's really important here. I want to talk to you about this. And in either case, that, that's what he's done. Now, I think, I think it's the former. I think he's looked inside Nicodemus' heart and he sees seeking there. He sees questions there that need answering. And he just jumps right into it. He, he, we're not going to waste time talking in generalities, talking nice to each other about how I'm a rabbi, you're a rabbi, we can do the rabbi talk. No. We're going to jump in and talk about answers to the questions that you already have in your heart. And so he starts this by saying, and it depends on what translation that you have. He starts this by saying, truly, truly. Uh, or you'll see some tr English translations that say, verily, verily, which is, you know, old school speak for truly, truly. And whenever Jesus says this, you need to pay attention because he is about to tell you something that is absolutely true. And this double, this doubling up of this words is a Hebraism. It's a, it's a Hebrew form of turning up the intensity of what you're talking about. When, when, um, when it was, I think it's Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was called and he is, caught up into heaven and he sees, correct me if I'm wrong, dad, this is Jeremiah when he sees the, the worship service that's going on in heaven before the throne of God and the angels sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The thrice holy God, they, they raise his holiness up to the third degree, which is the most you ever see in the Bible, that that's his holiness is turned up. Here, we see this. It's not to the thrice power. This is just doubled. Truly, truly, I say to you, pay attention because what I'm about to tell you is really, really true. And then he goes on to say something. He says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here, Jesus is now picking back up on a subject that was briefly touched on in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, um, David, can you read for me? Let's flip to John chapter 1. Read for me John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. That's the first time that we see this. Still with me, David? You might be muted. All right, I'm not hearing anything. Luke, are you with us? Tell you what, these yeah. guys on the... I'm here. Who's there? Luke, you there? Luke. All right, Luke, can you read for me out loud, John? Chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Very good. So here, what he's describing to Nicodemus as being born again, and I've got a footnote in my Bible, and I saw it also in the commentaries, that this, this, these words born again in the Greek, it's kind of ambiguous, and it can also be interpreted born from above, which is more descriptive and kind of connotes the same thing we get some hints about the details of that in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. As a little review, in John chapter 1, John tells us that this birth, this new birth, is not, we're, it's not of blood. It's not of the will of 
man and I can't write it all tonight and not of the will of, oh, I got it out of order. That one's flesh. This is not of the will of man. And so to review, we know that this is a, not a natural birth. It's not of blood. It's a supernatural birth. And not of the will of the flesh, which means that it's not myself that can do it. And if it's not of the will of man, then there's not others who can do it. So what does Jesus say is the result of this? Like, let's flip back over to John chapter 3 and verse 3. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What is there about us that we're unable to do until we're born again? Dad, you're muted. Are you looking for see the kingdom of God? Yeah, to see the kingdom of God. There's something about it that, that we can't even visualize. We cannot understand. We can't put together in our minds until we are born again. That before the new birth, we are in spiritual, we're under spiritual blindness. that this is something that's a part of who we are by our very nature, that we're spiritually blind. And Nicodemus responds and says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus follows this up with, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we see that not only can you not see the kingdom of God because of spiritual blindness. Hey, David, all we can hear on your mic is, is uh, sounds like wind. Can you mute that or something? All right, I think he's muted. All right, so in addition to spiritual blindness, we also have a spiritual inability. That there's something we're unable to do as a result of not being born again. That our first birth enables us to do some things, but it's not until we receive a new birth that we are able to do these things, to see the kingdom of God and to enter the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus's first response to what Jesus says to him is sort of bewilderment. Ben, can you reread for me what he says in verse four? He says, um, but how can anyone be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Is he, do you think he's almost being like sarcastic a little bit? Like a little well, sarcastic? that's a way to think about it. Is he being sarcastic? Um, I don't think he's being sarcastic. If we remember, <coughs> excuse me, who Nicodemus is, he is a Pharisee, an expert in understanding the law and following it. He is also a ruler of the Jews and a teacher of the Jews. And as a teacher, one of his jobs would be to help people understand the intricacies of Scripture, which means he would have been familiar with the idea um, of parables and comparisons. So comparables and analogies. So here, Jesus is using a term called born again, or the new birth. He's talking about a, an idea of spiritual regeneration, and Nicodemus has a problem with it. His problem is not the analogy that's used. His problem is really that twofold. One, this is a, a, a phrase that has been used in the Jewish community for something else, and now it's being applied to this. So that's one of his problems. We'll talk about that. The other is that he has a problem with the consequent, like the, um, the conclusions that we can draw from this. 
So let's address the first problem, which is the idea that Jesus is reusing a phrase that he knows, but has previously applied it to something else. So who remembers in John chapter 1, there are some Jews who come to John the Baptist, and they question him about his baptism, about the fact that he was baptizing on the Jordan River in Bethany, why do they come and ask him these questions in that case? Why did they come to John the Baptist and say, uh, and ask him those questions? What, what was he doing that they were having a problem with? Does anybody remember that? Baptizing. Say that again, Billow? He was baptizing. But who was he baptizing? <clears throat> well, it said, uh, verse 25 said, they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Right. So he was baptizing with a baptism of repentance. And he was baptizing everybody. He was calling Jews to repent and be baptized. He was calling non-Jews to repent and be baptized. And baptism was already a part of the, the processes for somebody becoming a part of the Jewish community. If you were born not a Jew, you were born a Greek or a Gentile, and you wanted to become a Jew, you would be brought into the Jewish community through a process where you ended up becoming a proselyte. This is somebody who's a Gentile that has now become a Jew. Part of that process was baptism. But something that you never did to somebody who was already a Jew was baptize them because that would signify that they were unclean, that they were outside of the covenant community and they needed to be brought in. Well, they were born into the covenant community, so they don't need to be baptized as a result. They don't need to wash away their heathen ways. And so this idea of baptism was something that they said, you need to be, if you're John the Baptist, if, if you're doing something that's outside of our normal processes here, you need to be somebody who has authority to do that. And hence they asked him all these questions about his identity. And in this case, Jesus, now in John chapter 3, Jesus is using a phrase called being born again to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is looking back to this process whereby a proselyte is baptized and circumcised and brought into the Jewish community. The Jews would have called that proselyte born again. That's a phrase that they already had, but it meant something different. It didn't mean something that happened inside them. It meant something that happened outside of them. In other words, you're, now that you're born again, you're doing different things. You're going through this process of doing the things that Jews do, that it's something that happens externally. Whereas Jesus is now applying it internally, and he's applying it spiritually. So he's got a little bit of a problem with the words here. He's also got a problem with the conclusion here. He, he asks Jesus, how, how can a man be born when he is old? And his problem is not that the man is old. And his problem is really not that, that, that it's happening a second time. His question, if we read closely, is, can he enter? Can he enter into his mother's womb and be born a second time? He's thinking about this picture of birth. I don't know about you, but when I was born, I had a zero input into the process. In other words, I was born, and it happened to me. It wasn't something that I woke up and said, I'm going to be born today. It's something that happened to me. And here he's saying, how about a man that, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, if he can't do that, and you're talking about a spiritual birth, and this is the analogy you're giving, can he make himself born again? And Jesus' answer is no. But he gives a, a longer answer than that. But this is, this is sort of calling back to what John referred to in the very first chapter, those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is a supernatural birth. 
um, that happens to you. It's a spiritual birth that happens inside you. I'm going to pause there for questions because I see Bellows rubbing his head and, and there may be others that are wondering. Thoughts, questions? I'm, I mean, it's, I'm sitting here looking at verse four. It's, it's almost like Jesus turns his words on him. I mean, it's almost like he's, Nicodemus brings up something. It's, uh, it's almost like he's challenging Jesus in a way to say, give me something more clear because he's talking about entering your mother's womb when you're old, which obviously is impossible. Everybody would know that. Right. If he's speaking literally, it seems to be fairly literal. And Jesus' answer uses almost the same exact words. You know, yep. he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the mother's womb a second time. In the verse four, he can't do that because it's physically impossible. In verse five, it's spiritually impossible. Mm -hmm. To me, I see verse four and five and being contrast, which, you know, scripture is full of contrast to make a point. Yep. As like you said, you go back over to uh, chapter one and it says it's not of the, uh, not of the blood, not of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Verse 12, right before that says to those who believe in his name. It's like Jesus is trying to make him understand there's a, there's a condition here. There's something that has to happen that you can't, you can't do it by yourself. It's not something you can manufacture or promote yourself to or inherit or anything like that. Absolutely. <laughs> anything of the flesh is flesh. Anything of the spirit is totally different. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's, I thank you because you've said these things in, in better ways than I was even planning on saying them. Um, there is, there is something that we in our nature are incapable of doing that needs to be done for us. It needs to be done in us and needs to be done to us. And that's the regeneration. That's the new birth. When we hear this big theological word, regeneration, this means new birth. So let's continue. Because Jesus is going to tell you what, though, we've got 12 minutes. Um, rather than push through the next three verses here, I may pause there, and I want us to sort of step back and look at where Nicodemus is, where Jesus is in this story, and let's read some other passages about Nicodemus and see where he ends up as a result. Um, so before we go on, I, I want us to note, and especially now that we've brought up this word regeneration, let's look at the first, the other two things that Jesus has done right here at the beginning of his ministry. At the beginning of John chapter 2, Jesus has gone to Cana in Galilee for a wedding. And what does he do in Cana that's important? Who remembers? Very first miracle. The very first miracle. And what was his first miracle? Water into wine. That's right. Oh, I can hear you now, David. Hey, he's turning water into wine. So his miracle was to, to take those six stone jars, fill, he had the servants fill them all the way up with water, up to the brim, draw some out, put it in a cup, and take it to the master of the feast, who proclaims, this is the best wine that I have tasted at this wedding. And so this is a miracle where he took very plain water, added nothing to it, did not wave his hands over it or speak over it in any way. He just said, draw it out and take it. And this was a miracle of transformation. This is a demonstration of his creative power through a process of transformation, something that was basic and simple and transform it into something that is new and rich and full of life. Then he goes to Jerusalem in verse 13 of chapter 2. And what does he do that's important in Jerusalem? He cleans up the temple. He cleanses the temple. That's right. 
There's this temple that we drew last week with the three courts, and in the outer court were the tables that they were selling the animals. And Jesus goes and gets a big whip that he's made, and he drives the animals out with it and runs at all the vendors, and then directly responds to the men who had given their blessing to these activities when they say, you know, why are you doing these things? And what sign do you give us? And the only sign he points to is his death and resurrection. That's not going to happen for another three years. This is a, this is a sign or an act of reformation. There is moral corruption that was in the temple at the time, in the Jewish community at the time, and he is now reforming it. He didn't go in and say, well, I think we could teach here and maybe do a little Bible study outside, and maybe the guys inside would eventually leave. It wasn't like an incremental thing. He went in to wipe it out and say, we're going to go from the bottom of the barrel to the best. We need to take out all this corruption and bring in spiritual wholeness. That's reformation. And so we see that his, act, his first three acts right here in John is a miracle of transformation, an act of reformation in the temple, and now a discourse on regeneration with Nicodemus, that there is something that happens in our fallen nature that, that to heal spiritual blindness, to give us spiritual ability to enter the kingdom of God that has to happen. And that's taking the baseness of even our best works trying to achieve our own righteousness and raising it to a new level of faith whereby the Spirit comes in and gives us new life from himself. And these are the first three things that Jesus does in his ministry here in the Gospel of John. I wanted us to see that, that he's, he's not settling for little bitty increments of change. He's coming in and setting the stage for something new. He's setting the stage for the new covenant to come in and replace the old, to completely replace people's understanding of their relationship with God. And so here Nicodemus comes onto the scene with a question that Jesus uses as an opportunity to have this discourse. And Nicodemus at this point, um, if we continue to read, honestly, after his response in verse 9, we don't hear from him again for the rest of this chapter. But I want us to see... Uh, we'll, we'll continue through John chapter 3 in the next few weeks, but I want us to see where Nicodemus ends up. So before we close tonight, let's read a couple more passages in John. David, is your, is your microphone working? I'd like for you to have a chance to read if you can. Okay. All right. I've got you. If you can read for me, we're in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 40. John chapter 7, verse 40 through 52. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who has gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone? without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find what a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Very good. So here, this is a good time later. Jesus has fallen so far out of favor with the ruling body in, uh, of the Jews that they are now divided amongst themselves about what to do about him. And they actually send officers to go and arrest him. Well, they come back empty-handed because they're amazed by the things Jesus is teaching. 
and they rail even against their own guards and tell them that they're accursed. And Nicodemus, this same Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night, now stands up in their midst and publicly challenges them about how they're behaving towards Jesus. And, and he doesn't come right out and say, hey, this guy really is who he says he is. He doesn't come out and say, I'm a believer in Jesus as the Messiah. But he says, now, wait a minute. I, doesn't our law not judge a man without first giving him a fair hearing? And they immediately pounce on him. Oh, are you a Galilean too? Why are you so in love with this guy? And they start to challenge him. So we see Nicodemus is beginning to, he's been thinking about the things Jesus is teaching. He's probably been following what's been going on and learning from him and about him. And now he's beginning to change his mind away from the way that other Pharisees are thinking about it and towards Jesus. He at least wants to give him a fair trial. So the last time we hear about Nicodemus is in John chapter 19. And Pete, if you're with us still, I Zoom pushed you off the side for me. So I, are you still here, Pete? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Read for me in John chapter 19. Jesus has been crucified and his side has been pierced. And then let's read John chapter 19 verses 38 through 42. 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a, a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Very good. So here, this is at the, the very end of Jesus's life as a man on this earth before he is now buried. Um, Joseph, who I think in some of the other Gospels, it says that this was his tomb that Jesus was buried in, comes and Nicodemus comes with him and brings a very large amount of spices to, to help prepare Jesus's body for burial. This is not something that you do for somebody uh, that you don't care very deeply about, that this was something that, that Nicodemus did to honor the man that he came to know and understand as the Son of God. Uh, this, is, this is an act of worship to God, and that he's paying deference to him and, and burying him in this way. And so we see that Nicodemus' relationship to Christ has grown significantly over this time. First, he comes to him unsure with questions. When presented with answers, he goes, I don't get it. You've got to explain this better to me. How could these things even be? And that conversation is the seed which then grows in Nicodemus to the point that he's so not even worried about what the Pharisees are going to say about him that he goes and helps prepare Jesus' body for burial. That's... Um, that's, this is not something that, that is taken lightly by Jews. To, to even handle a dead body is, is coming into contact with something that is super unclean. You would have taken a very long time to go through a process to then be ceremonially clean again. For you to, to go and do that on the behalf of somebody that's not your immediate family, this is a significant honor that he is paying Jesus at this point. So that's where Nicodemus ends up. And next week, we're going to continue in the conversation of Jesus with Nicodemus. So please, please read ahead um, all of his conversation with Nicodemus, which ends at like verse 21, is rich stuff. And in the midst of that, we're going to see the most quoted and probably most misquoted Bible verse uh, of all time, which is John 3.16, that there are a lot of people who quote that, but don't really think about 
what it's saying, and they always quote it out of context with the rest of what it says. So they're, they're, they're missing out on the meat almost uh, of the rest of Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see it all in context as one story. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Scott. Thank y'all for being here. Thank you. Enjoyed it. What do you, what do y'all think? Y'all have any closing thoughts or questions? A thing I'm I'm having trouble wrapping my head around is the concept of the Jews back in the day considering baptism rebirth even for a a, a Gentile proselyte. Yeah, I, from what I've read, it's not a rebirth in the same way that Jesus is talking about rebirth. That it's more of an analogy of you, are, uh, you were a heathen, you were outside of the covenant community, um, you were steeped in the sin of your father's ways and traditions as a Gentile, and you're now being birthed out of that, so to speak, into a new life. Okay. So not really a inward heart transformation, but a change in leaving the things of the past behind and now taking on a new life in the Jewish community. Okay. That's, I think, more what they had in mind. Probably not that much different than what we see today with some of the people who hijack the idea of being a quote unquote Christian. I heard a guy, I heard a guy say one time that uh, his business burnt down and me and my wife happened to work for him at the time. He showed up at the scene as the fire trucks were putting the fire out. And said, I guess uh, Jill told you what I decided. And I said, no, what? He said, I think this is a sign from God. He said, I'm going to, he said, I'm going to go, go full, full bore for God the rest of my life and, and do, and just live for him. And all he was really saying was that he was going to do things differently because mm. he had had an experience. Mm. and it's very similar to what they were doing back then they hadn't they did something a ritual an experience and then suddenly we're going to do things different mm. but they were still doing it in the flesh so religious flesh is still dead flesh yeah. yeah and his his life ended up pointing to the exact same results because he yeah. doesn't live for god at all <laughs> it lasts about 60 days that's that's a good example absolutely Absolutely. Anybody else? Well, before we go, um, you know, I, 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 I know several people that have been taken out of their, their workspaces and are now at home. Some can work home effectively. Some are sick. Some are caring for those who are sick. If there's something that's in your life that I can be praying for you this week, um, I would like to do that. I'll go ahead and end the recording so that we can talk about these things freely. Um, but I just wanted to tell you guys that I am praying for you by name uh, during the week. But if there's something specific that I can pray for you, please tell me. And um, thank you to each of you for being here. <laughs>